Hello and good afternoon, uh, everyone. Um, it's so nice to see so many uh, friendly faces and names back again. Um, I think this is going to be a fun one this week. Um, as hopefully some of you, although hopefully not too many know, um, my name is Matt. I look after our research team here at Uni Admissions. Um, so all of the graphs, all of the data stuff you're going to be seeing over the next few slides, that's all my work. And that's part of our, our ongoing commitment to make sure that everything that we uh, put out in terms of recommendations, in terms of strategies, in terms of application tactics, that all of that stuff is really well grounded in data, that we can back it up with a big pile of Microsoft Excel. Um, so that's what I do around here. And so I'm going to be talking through some of uh, some of the insights we have from that today. Um, I'm drawn today by my colleague, Rowan. Hopefully he can say hello. Uh, hello, Rowan. Hello. Hi. It's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> Lovely stuff. Um, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself, Rowan. What, what, what do you do? Um, so I myself, uh, I'm an admissions consultant here at Uni Admissions. Um, so I'll be the one uh, obviously being able to speak to people and seeing their particular needs and seeing how we can help yourselves um, with your application. Lovely stuff. Uh, Rowan has much closer contact with um, all of you guys, so he'll hopefully be able to chip in here and there with some useful um, examples, because I, I, they don't let me talk to people. I have to spend all of my time in the Excel mine um, playing with numbers and trying to get the count ifs functions to work properly. Um, as hopefully you know, we're going to be talking today about how to set yourself apart from, um, from other applicants. Um, and next week, although this isn't super confirmed yet, um, we're going to be taking a little bit of a tour through personal statement do's and don'ts. Um, this is a particular favourite of mine because it lets me go into my personal statement archive and pull out some particularly bad ones, uh, which is always fun. Um, so that's something to look forward to, at least for me, perhaps not for yourselves. Um, so we'll be talking a little bit today about how we've come up with the numbers we're going to be talking about. Um, what it takes to put together a competitive application, um, and also the things that we can uh, we can do to help. Um, so to start off with this uh, this number, this eighty four percent we've been talking about, um, where does that come from? So the first thing to say is that um, because of the changes brought on by the pandemic in the way that A levels have worked, it has become harder and harder for universities to tell which applicants are the most capable. Um, if you look here, for example, at the year 2000, uh, where fewer than 20% of people um, were getting an A, um, that meant that although there's an in, although there's an intercorrelation, you're probably only looking at eight or nine percent of students getting straight A's. This was before the A star had even been invented, because A was in the that straight A was enough to differentiate between the the really the really wonderful students and those who were a little less capable. Um, as you can see, as time went on. Um, the shares of um, students getting A's went up, um, leading to the point where the A star was introduced. I think that was 2008, maybe 2009. Um, I know I didn't get any A stars, and I think it's because they didn't exist. Um, it might have been because I was I was just a, a mediocrity, but I'm, I'm fairly sure it's because they didn't exist. Um, but of course, all of this changed around the pandemic because of the way that centre assessed grades work. And we saw this enormous jump where we went from around 21, 22% of students getting A, a stars to um, fully 40, 43, 45%. Um, and we see very much the same pattern if we look at the GCSEs, um, where over the past 20 years, we've had this real jump in the um, scoring on GCSEs to the point where, um, I mean, I haven't had any confirmation on this, but when they reformed the GCSE scoring system to go up to nine, I think we all realized it's because they were, they were planning on getting a 10 in there one day, but uh, waiting for it. Um, that's the great thing about uh, doing the numbers that way around. You know, you do, you are sort of stuck after A star. I guess you do A double star or A galaxy. You, you have to come up with something new. Whereas the nice thing about numbers is as long as you're going up, um, there, the sky really is the limit. Um, perhaps our children will one day be able to get an 11 on their GCSEs and people can make jokes about um, Spinal Tap. Um, which I guess no one will make jokes about by then because everyone will be even older than they are now. So 1980s music jokes will be, yeah. People will ask me if I can remember when the Beatles broke up, things like that. Um, so um, taking this data into account, the other thing to bear in mind is that the number of 
um, people applying to, we can look at Oxford and then Cambridge here, the number of people applying to Oxford each year has been rising really quite steadily over the past um, five, six years. And what you'll see is while the number of students applying has gone from under 20,000 to just under 25,000, so we're looking at growth of well over 5,000 students a year, which compared to what we started off is more than 25% growth, 26, 27, something like that. Um, what you'll see is the number of places available has barely moved. Um, that blue column is growing, but that orange column, it really isn't going anywhere. Um, and it has got stuck around the 3,200 mark. Um, we see that there was even a drop off last year where the number of students, the number of offers made fell compared with 2020. And that again is a part of the impact of the pandemic. So many students were admitted in 2020 because of the mess with the grades. They've had to cut back in subsequent years to um, sort of rebalance things as they've had a, a hump of um, students coming through in the 2020, uh, 2020 cohort. We see um, very much the same pattern with Cambridge, although Cambridge, to their credit, um, have done a little bit better of a job of increasing the number of places available. Um, it's fairly, it's still fairly imperceptible, but there is a small uptick as Cambridge has got a little bit closer to that 5,000 mark. Um, but again, we see that uh, the number of applications has ridden from something like 17,000 all the way up to 23,000. And those 6,000 extra applicants, the, um, the number of places available for them to take just isn't there um, because for fairly intuitive logistical reasons, it's quite difficult to expand the university, um, but it's fairly easy to expand the number of people applying. What this has meant is if we look um, at Oxford and Cambridge together now, what we see is that the rate at which students are receiving offers has been in fairly smooth decline over the past five, uh, five six years. So where in 2016, you would have had just under a 20% chance at Oxford and just over a 25% chance at Cambridge. That chance has just slowly slipped down to the point where um, while Cambridge was uh, slightly easier to get into than Oxford five, six years ago, um, Cambridge is now harder to get into than Oxford was then, and Oxford is harder still. Um, so we're looking at a decline from about 26% down to about 18%, and from about 20, 19.5% down to about 14.5%. So it doesn't, these don't sound like um, enormous changes. You've got to bear in mind we're not studying from very high levels. So we are looking at something like, an, rather than you being up against uh, four students for your place, at Oxford, there's now you're now up against um, five, and similarly for Cambridge, it's that that extra bit of competition. Um, so, the thing to bear in mind here as well is that this um, competitiveness is not completely linear. Um, it really does depend on the subject you're applying to. So, some subjects are much more popular than others, and we're going to look at some data from Oxford on that in a moment. Um, and the gaps here can be really striking. So. Only 16% of students who apply to study biochemistry get an offer at Oxford, but 35% of those who apply to study chemistry get an offer. So that's double your, more than double your chances simply by um, foregoing the bio at the beginning of the, of the name. I'm not totally sure what the difference between chemistry and biochemistry is. Um, I'm neither a chemist nor a biochemist. Um, but if you've got your hearts on Oxford, then that kind of thing is really helpful to know because it might make a big ch change to your kind of calculus. Um, the other thing to bear in mind here, and this is, is surprisingly little known, um, is that despite being the smallest city, Cambridge has a substantially larger medical school. Um, and so while roughly similar numbers of people apply to Oxford and Cambridge for medicine, um, Cambridge take more simply because they have a bigger medical school, more scope for training, and so your chance of getting into medicine at Cambridge are almost double of your chance of, of getting in at Oxford, purely because there are more places. Um, the number of students who apply is extremely similar, and it really is just down to it being a, basically down to Addenbrooke's just being a blooming massive hospital, uh, whereas the University of Oxford Hospital is just a normal sized hospital. Um, so that's helpful to know if you're applying for medicine. It's a, a little bit of a sneaky one there. Um, so I mentioned the different competitiveness of different subjects. Um, so what I've done is I've pulled out here. Um, you can see on here uh, on the y-axis, we've got the um, competitiveness of each subject. So here at the very far end, we've got classics where more than 60% of applicants at um, Cambridge are getting a place to um, study classics. 
And we've got right down at the other end, computer science, where only around 10% of the students are getting a place to study computer science. Um, and so what you can see there is that there's a really big difference between subjects and the differences, the different subjects sort of fit along on this fairly smooth graph going from the most competitive, going from the least competitive to the most competitive. Um, yeah, this is, a, this is a new piece of data. I can see that Rowan's enjoying it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and so what you'll what you'll see here is that um the sciences tend to be a little more competitive than the humanities um but also that there are um interesting differences that i think are um uh helpful to take into account when you're thinking about what kind of subject you're you're going after um you know if you are um absolutely certain on computer science then you can see where computer science sits on that um, whereas maths, which um, it isn't included on this particular version of the graph, I will have to pull that up in a moment and see if I can get the um, the other bit of data up. Um, but you'll see that um, uh, maths is sitting uh, substantially higher up than that, as is natural science, engineering, um, almost double the chance. So if you're if you're deciding between subjects, still taking that sort of thing into account, you know, if you think you could um, forego history in favour of classics for that extra bump in chances. You know, that's really worth taking into account. Um, and we see very similar patterns with Oxford. Um, the reason I've used Cambridge rather than Oxford for this graph is that Oxford has more individual subjects um, and it was harder to fit them in the graph and it looked ugly. Uh, so we've gone for Cambridge, but you get pretty much the same pattern with Oxford. It's just that the graph wasn't as nice. Um, and I'm a slave to aesthetics like that. I will never apologize for that. Um, so um, that brings us on to uh, a very familiar piece of data, which is our famous pie chart. Um, are you good to talk about the pie chart, Rowan, for a moment while I go and see if I can find um, the uh, other data points for that particular um, graph I've just shared? Of course, Matt. Um, so generally, um, when the universities are looking for each section um, of the uh, or looking at each section of the application for each student. Uh, they generally look at four things. Um, so you see there, we, we've got them set out for your A-level predictions. Uh, so things like what, what school you're going to, what, what your grades are, things like that. Um, your admissions tests, uh, which as you can see is a much larger piece uh, there, your interview, and also your personal statement as well. So these are roughly brought into your academic background, which is 10%. Uh, everything else, which are things like the personal statement and everything, is another 10%. Um, then the admissions tests and the interviews are both 40% each as well. Um, so while it is important to obviously have good results in everything, um, some parts do have a sort of higher weight um, with your application. Bab, uh, thanks Rowan. Um, not to worry. Um, and the thing to, to take into account here when we're thinking about the um, the kind of weighting of these things is to um, sort of look on the bright side of it, which is to see just how much of your application you still have control over. Um, because um, of the relatively low weight of GCSEs, um, because um, A-level predictions are notoriously unreliable, um, that admissions test and then the interview after that really makes a huge difference to your application because that's going to be the only... Um, 100% um, comparable piece of information that the universities have to work with. So if you imagine that, um, you know, in, in recent years, we've had students not necessarily sitting the same sit down exams. But even before that, we've always had the situation of some students sitting the IB, some students doing AQA rather than Excel, students doing um, uh, Scottish hires, doing Irish leaving cert. There's been such a mix of um, qualifications that students are coming in with. The only thing that you can be absolutely certain they've all done and that you can make a, a completely fair comparison on is that admissions test. Um, and so that's why that has such a such a large and increasing weight in, in our um, calculations is that because it's the, the one thing that you can absolutely compare the students across, whereas the other data points tend to be a little bit less reliable. Um, so these admissions tests. Um, Pretty much every subject at Oxford and Cambridge will have one. Um, 
There are a handful of exceptions. Chemistry, for example, at Oxford doesn't have an admissions test. Um, this is part of an ongoing process by them to use that as the um, the kind of, as the kind of uh, control group um, for making sure the tests work. Um, for Oxford, most of these tests are sat um, about two weeks after the UCAS deadline. Um, I think there's something like the 3rd of November this year, but I think the dates have shuffled around in slightly interesting ways this year. So that's something I would have to, uh, I would have to double check um, because I know that the BMAT is surprisingly early this year. Um, it's exciting for everyone. Um, for Cambridge, some of the tests are done in advance, um, normally on the same day or the following day as those for Oxford. And some of them you'll do um, when you're up there for interview. And it tends to be this just kind of, ugh, ugh. it tends to be the subjects that are less competitive that you'll do it when you're up there, and the students uh, subjects that are more competitive you'll do it. Um, uh, you'll do it beforehand. Yes. Uh, thank you, Lookman, for reminding. Yes, the BMAT is about ten minutes after the UCAS deadline this year. It's quite literally on Monday, and the UCAS deadline is on Friday. Um, so if you're if you're preparing for the BMAT, be ready um, because that is a surprise. Uh, sorry, the BMAT, the UCAS deadline is uh, Saturday evening, and the uh, the BMAT is Tuesday morning. So that is that is not long. Um, so make sure you are focusing on the BMAT rather than shuffling around the commas in your personal statement um, when it comes to you, you know deciding about your preparation. Uh, thanks, Lookman. That's really handy. <laughs> I, I knew something was going on. I just couldn't remember the exact numbers. Um, but this is why it's so important to um, make sure you know what you're expecting for your subject, um, because the last thing you want to do, and this happens to students every year, um, is there'll be students who apply and then are surprised to discover there is a test. And the test is in, you know, in the case of medicine in four day, in three days, or the test might be in two weeks. And the quality of revision you can do in two weeks, absolutely, you can improve your performance, but you can't do you know, even 15, 20 hours of revision in two weeks is, is going to be a stretch for a lot of people alongside schoolwork. Um, whereas 15, 20 hours of revision, if you've been planning for three months, that's an hour a week. Like the, the returns to planning ahead are, are so huge here. And so you don't want to be in a, in a position where you're um, uh, not looking, you know, really strong compared with the students who've only just found out about the test. Um, and the reason for that as well is because these tests have a, a really strong correlation with outcomes. If we look here at the um, correlation between uh, scores in the Oxford maths test um, and the application outcomes, you'll see that in the sort of the first half of the distribution, pretty much no one is getting an interview, which is what shortlisted means in this context. Um, and it's not until you are getting into the um, into the 60s, really, that you see students getting interviews reliably. And it's not until you're into the 70s that students are really getting offers. Um, what you'll see is that we basically have three bell curves here. Um, the first classic bell curve for all students, a second nested bell curve um, for those who were interviewed, and then a bell and then a slightly smaller, slightly scrunched bell curve um, that we get uh, for students who are getting offers. Um, the curves do slightly weird things because of the asymptote of 100. Um, but you know, we're not going to go too far into the maths of it. Um, but as you can see, the relationship between that admissions test score and that offer is, um, is really strong. Now you might think, okay, but that's for maths, right? Um, maths, go to maths. Um, but what about um, subjects where the relationship between what you're going to be studying and what you're being tested on isn't quite as direct? Um, so if we look at the TSA, um, which is the test for students who are applying for PPE at Oxford, um, we see very much the same pattern again, um, that until you're scoring um, above about 75, um, you might get interviewed, but chances, uh, chance, your chance of getting an interview is still only, still barely 50-50, um, and that hardly any offers are being given out to anyone who's scoring um, below about 65-66. Whereas once you get up into those top scores, into the 70s, into the 80s, everyone's getting an interview, um, and you're getting to the point where um, your chance of getting a place are really pretty good at that point. Um, of course, everyone who has a place has also had an interview. So it's the, the from when it comes to the interview, it's the grey and the not grey you need to be looking at to see um, kind of the adjustments there. This is for the problem solving section of the TSA, so the bit with words. Um, uh, and we see, oh no, this is the bit with numbers, sorry. 
<laughs> problem solving is a bit with numbers. Uh, critical thinking is the bit with words. Um, and we see very much the same pattern here. Um, what you'll also notice, and this is really important to think about, um, is just how clustered these columns are. So um, the difference for a student scoring between 65 and, six, uh, 65 and 70, we see that there are nearly 500, 450 students in that, in that category, in between 65 and 70. So that is something like 90 students at each one of those point boundaries. Um, so that means that if you are getting one, two, three extra correct answers in that test, each of those correct answers is leapfrogging you ahead of 100 students each time. You know, if you've got, as you have here, over 1,000 applicants, suddenly if you get three extra correct answers, you've overtaken 300 of them. Um, and you know, if you can, if you can imagine that in a kind of in a kind of physicalized setting, you know, if you're all in a big queue outside Oxford waiting to get in, imagine what it would be like to get that one extra question right, and just to be. It would take it would take you like two or three minutes to walk past all of the people who you had just defeated, right? You would just you would just be swanning past them. All of these, you know, potentially two, three, four hundred people. And you're swanning past, going, "Well, I had, I got three extra correct answers actually." And there you are, and you're walking, you're just walking past people who you've bettered for 10 minutes. Um, you know, that's what the 84% the really means. It's 84% uh, of people you get to sort of walk past in this imaginary scenario and think that you've uh, you've outdone them. Um, perhaps perhaps you're all, are all more generous and modest than me. Perhaps that doesn't appeal quite so much as a fantasy. But, <laughs> but if, it, if it does appeal, you're not alone. Um, uh, the other thing to say here is we've looked um, here at, um, at, at questions uh, involving maths and involving critical thinking, um, but we see very much the same pattern emerging even for um, essay subjects. So if we look at the results um, um, uh, using Cambridge data here um, for the ELATS, which is the test for studying English, um, although uh, officially um, students are just put into four bands for their ELATS score, um, based uh, as you can see what we see is again once you get the data out um, you find that there is a really strong correlation between the scores of the uh, average applicant getting a few extra points up to the average interview and then getting over into the the offer holding zone and again as you can see here we're looking at smaller numbers of applicants than we would be with PPE but again you can see that that extra that extra little bit of insight you know avoiding a few spelling mistakes um, that slightly better structured answer. All of those things are getting you an extra point or two when you're overtaking 40, 50, 60 other applicants. And the difference between you, you know, getting, being a perfectly average applicant, getting that interview, we're looking at maybe 100 students you're looking to overtake. And then getting that offer, maybe another 100. You know, we're not talking huge numbers of people, particularly when you think of those people as only having scored you know, one and a half points difference between interview and offer and only four and less than four points between average and, and interview. You know, we're not talking huge boundaries here, but we can see these admissions tests are making an enormous difference. Um, the R squared on them is really good uh, <laughs> for those of you who like going into the statistics of this. Um, so the way we, we sort of tend to conceptualize this is you know, if you want to be in that, uh, as Rohan says, if you want to be in that top 16%, if you want to overcome the um, the challenges that have been put uh, before you by the, the shortage of places, by the level of competition, um, it's all about making sure that you are um, maximizing your performance um, across all the all the different sections. So you, are, you, don't, you don't want to be doing just what, you know, every applicant does. You don't want to be doing what someone is doing if they've picked up a textbook or they've got, you know, they've done some practice questions. You want to be going further even than someone who's managed to um, get hold of a tutor to help them out with things. You want to be doing all of those things and more. You want to be doing that work with the question bank. You want to be doing that with the tuition. You want to be having um, things like the, the enrichment seminars, which we're going to come on to talk about, um, to, help you, to help you practice your sort of interview technique and your engagement with academic ideas. You want to have those, um, those mock interviews as well. You want to have plenty of them. Um, because as I can, I can tell from my, my own experience, um, if you go in there without enough, enough practice, then the temptation to panic and make things up, um, well, it happened to me. Um, so, you know, that level of preparation is something I'm 
really keen to impress upon students because it's an easy mistake to make. Um, all of these things make such a huge difference uh, in terms of your performance. Um, and yeah, I think this is where I'm going to hand over to Rowan to talk a little in a little bit more detail about the um, the work we do. Um, nice. Fab. Uh, so confusingly, Rowan, um, this is the this is one of the uh, versions of this where I still haven't managed to get the uh, the little icons in the same order as the themes. So ah, although right. it starts although it starts with uh, the resources section in this in this summary image, it actually starts with one to one tuition. Um, I I keep trying to fix it and I keep using the version that it hasn't been fixed on. <laughs> it happens. Don't worry. I know. <laughs> but there you go. Uh, lovely. So the way that we help, um, you know, we generally help using four, what, what we call, the, or what I end up calling sort of the four pillars. Uh, and the first thing uh, that, that we do to help is the one-to-one -one tuition, uh, as Matt was just saying there. So um, it, it's one-to-one -one tuition with, uh, as you can see, they're an expert uh, Oxbridge tutor. Um, and they'll be able, they've been through the, the same process that you guys would have been going through for the admissions tests. Um, and a lot of them have scored uh, incredibly highly within the top 10% nationally. Um, and so they've been th through the whole process. They're either doing it or past that. Um, and they've helped other people through the same process as well. And they've helped other people with uh, all of the different um, subjects and uh, obviously being able to answer any questions that you may have. Um, so they'll be able to help with with all sorts uh, in there as well. Um, and the second thing uh, that we generally help out with is we've got a library of resources um, that we have access to. Um, so with that, uh, the, the library of resources are once again created uh, with, by our tutors um, as well. And there are all sorts and all sorts of different subjects um, and more generalized ones uh, as well for you know, interview success uh, and all sorts there. Um, and uh, all of these uh, work very well with videos that are in place as well. Um, and they go into either previous intensive courses, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a second, um, but there's breakdowns of materials, questions, um, there's practice questions, past papers, uh, there's all sorts of resources that are available for yourselves um, and how we can really help improve your confidence and your skill building um, for uh, being able to, uh, to sort of excel um, you know, over other applicants. And uh, another way that we help as well um, is we will have uh, things like the, um, well, there's the intensive day courses, um, but there's also the, uh, before that, um, I'm just having a wee blank here, <laughs> just give me a moment. You, 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 <laughs> must, you must be thinking of the wonderful enrichment seminars, right? <laughs> yes, yeah, no, my apologies. Um, so yes, the, the enrichment seminars. Um, so these are weekly seminars that are essentially university level uh, lectures um, and they'll help you develop skills that you can cross section over to your particular um, application uh, and what you're studying. Um, so with these, they are set around what you're looking to apply for. So obviously there's a medicine one, there's economics, things like that. Um, and these happen every week. Uh, and they're very good to, to go to. They're all recorded uh, as well. So they're all live, uh, but they get recorded and then uploaded. So you can even watch previous ones if you are interested. And there are things like, um, there's student handouts for pre and further reading as well. So there's a lot more included than just you coming along to a seminar, but there's more to help develop there. Um, and the last thing would be, uh, as uh, I may have, gave away a little bit earlier is the intensive day courses, um, which are um, all based around sort of each hurdle of the application process. Um, so the main ones are for, or the, the, the ones are for the personal statement. Um, there's one for the interviews and there's one for your admissions tests as well. Um, so with the tests and the interviews, you get four mock tests and mock interviews um, as well to really help develop those skills. Uh, they're all over the course of one day, surprise with that kind of name. Um, 
And with the interview as well, it's not just with one set of tutors, um, as Matt was talking there earlier, being able to get a lot of experience um, with different types of tutors is very important as well. Because if you are just having an interview with one person over and over, sure, that'll help a little bit, but then you could go to your actual interview and they have a completely different style of, of doing that. And then you get completely caught off guard. Um, so all of these all come together to really help give you the confidence and the skills that you need to really excel with your application. Fab, thanks Rowan. Um, nice. As you mentioned, yeah, it's, it's really important to have that mix of people you're preparing with. Um, I'm sure one of the mistakes I made in my, I will confess, unsuccessful application to Oxford ah. 15 years ago, uh, when I was seven years old, because I'm so young, um, um, you know, one of the things I did wrong was I was only preparing with, um, you know, teachers I knew from school. And so, you know, when you've had a relationship with someone for, you know, five or six years, when they're people you have um, seen a lot of people you feel comfortable with, it's just not frightening enough. It doesn't, it doesn't create the right response. It doesn't, um, it makes you much more relaxed, much more confident. And what you actually want to practice is being surprised and frightened. Um, and unfortunately doing that with someone who's been teaching you for the last five years and you have a really good relaxed relationship with it doesn't, it doesn't produce that result. Um, the other thing to say is, we're glad to say that everything that we've talked about here, it seems to work. Um, we have success rates that we're really proud of, um, and we are on track, I think, pretty much on track to um, hopefully get our 500th um, offer this year, which I'm really excited about. Um, and we're particularly proud of our success rate to medicine as well, um, which goes to show that it's not just Oxford and Cambridge we can do it, but, but right across the board for the UCL and GKT and Imperial and all those, all those lovely places to become a doctor. Um, our results compare really favorably with even the most expensive schools in the country. Um, we are um, a lot less stylish than Eton. We don't have the hats. We don't have those fun jackets. Um, but uh, we do do a competitive job compared with their offer rate. Um, and we are a little bit on the cheaper side as well. Um, but on the other hand, I would like the outfits. So <laughs> six of one and a half a dozen of the other, really. Um, if you'd like to read a little bit about um, the experience of people who work with us, I recommend going on to Trustpilot, having a look and see what people have said. Um, that'll give you a really rounded sense of what we're about, the kind of results we achieve. Um, and I've been saying this for, I haven't actually checked today. Let's have a quick look, actually. Um, I've been saying that whoever um, writes a nice review on Trustpilot mentioning me, uh, how charming, how handsome I am, all these sorts of things, I will use that review. Um, here in this presentation but i can't i can't see one this is a this shame is, this is very frustrating so i would ask all of you um please uh go on there write a lovely review uh saying how nice i am um and we'll go forward we'll go forward from there um you'll be a part of this presentation for the, for the foreseeable future until a nicer review pops up uh, so that a little bit of com competition for all of you out there. Um, you can, um, as well as watching, um, I think over a hundred hours now of archive of these open days. I wouldn't recommend watching all a hundred. Uh, that's too much. Um, you can also listen to our podcast uh, where, uh, where Rohan, our founder, and my colleague Will uh, talk about all sorts of things from Oxbridge all the way through to the zombie apocalypse, apparently. Um, they have now finally invited me to be on the podcast, which I was very upset about for some months. Um, so I do now feel comfortable um, endorsing it, whereas previously I was dead set against it. Um, so that brings us into the final part of today, um, which is we're going to take some questions. So um, please drop your questions into the Q&A section. Um, I will answer uh, those that I can. Uh, Rowan will answer those that he can, and we'll go forward from there. Um, the only thing to say is, if you have a question that relates very much to your own personal circumstances, um, the subject you're, you're planning to study, the specific exam system you're, um, you're part of, if it's complicated, um, 
probably I won't be able to answer it here because I will have to go off, go off and do a little bit of research and figure out the answer. If that's the case, um, then the best thing to do is to get in touch with us um, by booking a consultation, as you'll see, hopefully, in the little animation that's running now. Um, that gives us a chance to have a proper conversation with you, um, and that'll be with Rowan, one of the other guys in that team. Um, and that means that we can really get to know you, get to know what you need, get to know what you want, um, and figure out the, the best path forward for you there. And that's all completely fee-free, commitment-free. It's just a chance to make sure that we're a, a good match together. Um, huh. Um, yeah, I don't think there's anything to, um, to add from, from that. Of course, you did forget, uh, Rowan, the fifth pillar of preparation, which is, as, as always, harsh, um, but we'll, I'll forgive you for that one this time. Um, ah, well, my apologies. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is the one you do after the others, traditionally, it's the expensive one. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Maria asks about, um, uh, competitiveness for veterinary medicine. Um, so the number I have for that is about 24%. Um, so roughly one in four students who are applying getting a place there. Um, and Marie has also asked about um, uh, support for the NSAA. And absolutely, we have um, NSAA specific support. Um, I don't think that'll be a, a problem at all to, to help out with that, would it, Rowan? No, no, not at all. That is something that we'd be able to help and, and give support with. Fab. Um, Julie asks about personal statements. Um, so we're going to talk more about personal statements next week, so I don't want to give too much away. Um, but what I would say is you don't want to necessarily focus on the number of books you've read. You want to focus on the, uh, the quality of the reading you've done. Um, if you had only read one book in preparation for your application, but that book was a really good, serious book, if you had only read, say, Plato's Republic, and you had really read it and you had really understood it and engaged with the ideas and you were able to talk about that um, in real depth in your personal statement, that would be absolutely fine. Um, what you want to avoid is being in a position where you talk about five or six or seven or eight books and you treat each one of them quite quickly. Um, and in that situation, it becomes very easy to treat them dismissively. Now, if you're applying to, to university, what you're applying to do is to spend a lot of time thinking very deeply about books. And if you, in the personal statement, come across the kind of person who thinks that they have outsmarted Plato, um, that's not gonna go down very well with people who are reading the personal statement, because it may be that they've spent their careers trying to figure out what's going on with Plato. Um, so I would say the thing there is to make sure that you are treating each of the texts that you talk about with the right amount of respect, you're taking it serious you're taking them seriously as ideas um and if you can show that level of engagement whether you've got one book or whether you've got 10 books you'll be fine but i would say when in doubt one fewer books in the personal statement is normally better than one more uh would be generally speaking my approach um and there is a question here about how much a um a course costs and if there's any scholarships um not particularly, um, with the cost it varies uh, depending on uh, exactly, or the investment itself uh, varies depending on what you specifically need with your application. Um, so obviously it, it depends on if you need support with the personal statement, with everything, or really exactly what your particular needs are. So it does vary with that as well. Fab. Uh... Thanks, Ron. Uh, Julie asks a question, uh, further question about uh, niche courses. Um, this is one I would have to go and look up because the information on that particular one that you've mentioned there, law and Spanish law, isn't in the aggregated data I have. Um, so that's a really good example of when it's helpful to give us a call because that gives me enough time to go and find out the answer. Um, Um, there's one here for uh, work experience in PPE Oxford. Um, so for work experience, uh, that would sort of come into uh, things like um, sort of the academic background and your um, 
sorry, it, it plays in hand with your grades and the school that, that you went to. Um, so even though work experience obviously isn't within that, it is sort of counted in that for the application process. Um, so it is important to obviously have a bit of a work experience, um, but all in all, it is it does still add into around 10% of the application process along with uh, the school as well. Yeah. Um, in terms of the kind of work experience you're looking at, um, PPE is a little bit like medicine in that it's really easy to think that you need to have the fanciest work experience. Um, so a lot of students will be really preoccupied when they're applying for medicine that they've had work experience in a hospital, they've had uh, work experience in a research lab, and that's really not the case. Um, the important thing is to try out if you like being a doctor, basically. Um, and that often means doing some of the grosser kinds of work experience, like care work, like voluntary work, like food banks, things like that. Things that put you up at will make you check if it's actually the kind of uh, lifestyle you want rather than just um, sort of something prestigious. Similarly with PPE, you know, obviously it would be great if you could get uh, work experience helping the prime minister. Um, not that there is one, um, but realistically, that's not going to happen. And so finding something that is relevant that speaks to your motivation for the course. Again, something like care work, something like volunteering uh, for a local food bank. Um, those things are gonna be just as valid as having work experience at Morgan Stanley or Goldman Sachs. Um, it's all about demonstrating that you are really passionate and interested in the subject, that you've got the, the motivation that you can link up the abstract ideas you'll be studying along with real world things. Um, and so I would say if you can, you know, Get in touch with your with lo with local politics if there's something you can do there. But even voluntary work that brings you into um, into contacts with you know the challenges of economics of philosophy um, is going to be just as useful in terms of demonstrating your um, your interest. Uh, Yi asks us about um, gap years. I think I have a few gap year students at the moment, right, um, Rowan? Yes, so, so we do have uh, quite a few people who are taking a gap year for various reasons, um, and that is something that we can obviously will work something towards to be able to help with the application. And if anything, it does help give you more time to prepare for the application itself. Yeah, um, yeah, and if you have the yeah the time to focus on that, that can be can be really helpful. Um, but of course, particularly, I think you mentioned your son was looking to apply for Imperial. Um, it's important to really stay on top of your maths as well in that situation. Um, it is much easier to forget how to do maths than it is to forget how to read. Um, and so you want to be you want to be careful with that one. Um, so I think that's another instance where having a um, a program of support can be really helpful because it does does give you a structure for that sort of thing. Um, there we go. Um, uh, ben asks about our support for the Angar. Again, just like the NSAA, we have a lot of support available there. Um, if you'd like to get in touch, we'll be able to figure out um, what kind of price point, what kind of support we can offer for you. Um, but as ever, it's difficult to tell without knowing what your current situation is, um, what exactly um, we would need. Um, there we go. Um, uh, Suda um, asks about 2020 students uh, joining us now for applications in 2023. As with the situation of students uh, going on a gap year, um, we're absolutely delighted to have students well in advance. Our results are better the further in advance we get to work with you. Um, and it gives us the chance to, you know, really build things up over a, a sustained period of time. And that um, tends to lead to better results. So it's something that we, we really encourage. So really, the sooner you join us, you know, don't, don't join us age 10. Um, but really, the sooner, you know, the further in advance you're getting involved, the better. Uh, Rowan, uh, oh, you're, you were going to answer William's question about psychology. Yes. Yes. So the acceptance rate um, at psychology, um, so the average uh, one at the moment for uh, Oxbridge in general um, is about 15%. Um, uh, in the top UK 50 schools, for example, it's actually 26%. Um, so it, even if you're at a, obviously a very good school, it is still quite competitive. Uh, and with ourselves, um, over the course of five years, um, our average uh, on getting students in um, to psychology is actually 78%. Yeah. 
uh, as well for that. So uh, it's a much more than just triple your chances. <laughs> okay. What a what a result! Thank you, Rowan. Um, You're welcome. Uh, Manal asks about problem solving skills. Um, so the the kinds of mathematical problem you're faced with in the in the BMAT, in the uh, TSA, they tend not to be particularly complicated mathematical problems. Um, these aren't tests where you're allowed to use a calculator. And generally speaking, if you're not allowed to use a calculator, it's because you won't need a calculator. Um, and that means that the arithmetic will be fairly straightforward. You'll be doing, you know, adding, subtracting, dividing, multiplying. There might be a square or a square root hiding in there somewhere, but it's fairly unusual. Um, the challenge with these tends to be um, getting from the words that they're presented in down to the actual mathematical question that you're trying to answer. Um, and this is one of those areas where you just really need to, to really practice at it. Um, getting hold of um, you know past papers, getting hold of the question bank, and working through um, these questions slowly, figuring out what the vocabulary means so that you can get more practiced at translating the, the words into maths, because the kinds of mathematical problem you'll get in problem solving, they tend not to be very complicated. It will often be something, when you actually get to it, it'll be something that'll take you two or three minutes. Um, two or three minutes, like 30 seconds even. Um, the difficult part is actually figuring out what the question is. Um, we'll probably, I haven't, I'm not totally certain of the um, timescales, but something we've done in the past is we've done a kind of live question thing um, where we uh, do all together um, a few problem solving questions. Um, that might be something that we do in a couple of weeks time. I will uh, suggest it because that can be a really useful um, way of testing that out. Um, uh, and getting a little bit of practice. Um, so uh, Lookman, you're asking about the uh, GCSEs this year, uh, as opposed to uh, the previous years. Um, so I, obviously Oxbridge, um, they, they do understand how uh, the GCSEs can be uh, a little unreliable, uh, as was mentioned earlier. Um, and really, realistically, it depends on what you're looking or what your sort of predicted grades for your A levels are. Um, obviously, if you've got uh, if you've got decent or good GCSEs uh, and then you're predicted well for your A levels, then they'll look a little bit more at the A levels and what you'll actually get from that um, rather than your GCSEs. But if your GCSEs were obviously very low, then, you know, I don't think they would, they would really have a look. <laughs> does, that, does that make sense? Fab. Uh, thanks, Ray. Um we had a question from Yi about uh, critical thinking support, um, and she suggests that we run a specific course. Now, I believe we do have a specific course for BMAC critical thinking uh, as part of our broader BMAC course coming up. I am not certain of when it is. I think it's in about six weeks' time. That would normally be when it is, more or less. Yeah, I'll, I'll need to have a wee look for it, but yeah. Ah, oh, thank you. So we do have one of those coming up, um, but good idea. Uh, so good, uh, we already had that idea. Um, <laughs> um, but I would uh, recommend coming along, signing up for that, um, and we'll be doing a little bit more work about um, about those kinds of questions. I think in the next couple of weeks, I'm gonna gonna suggest that to the big boss and see if we can get approval to do a a kind of live question one again because I I enjoyed it last time and I think it's really helpful. Um, um, William has a question about the difference between critical thinking and problem solving. Um, so the thing to bear in mind here is because the performance on the because the performance on the sections of the test is really highly correlated, it's um, it's difficult to tell where the causative mechanism is. So students who score higher on critical thinking are also the students who score higher on problem solving. Um, so generally speaking, it's not going to make it particularly big difference if you focus on one over the other, because we don't know which way around the causative mechanism works. Um, it's not as though being great at one and not being good at the other is, is an effective strategy, because in practice, you don't get people who are in that position. Um, so I would say, look at, your, um, look at your own performance first. You want to be getting the biggest score you can in either part. And if you find that you are scoring lower in one rather than the other consistently, then I would focus on the weaker one. If you find yourself in the unusual position that you are exactly as, uh, as good at um, both um, and you want to choose which one to focus your preparation on, I guess go for the one that has on average lower scores. 
But at the same time, um, I think you're better off, you know, if you're if you're equally good at both, dividing your time evenly on that um, would seem would seem the most sensible um, the most sensible thing. Uh, you had a question you were looking at from Suda, Rowan. Yes, so we do help uh, provide with UCAT test uh, preparation. Um, so we do have a particular program that would be just for help with the UCAT, um, or there is the more general uh, medicine one um, that would be able to help a little bit more with that. Uh, I know it's getting a little bit short with the timing on that, but we will we are able to provide help with that in particular. The thing to bear in mind there as well is the UCAT is quite a weird exam. Mm -hmm. um, it's not something that you can prepare for conventionally. It's not like it's full of factual science questions. It's a little bit strange. And so a little practice goes a long way in the UCAT. Um, it's one of those tests that's really easy to go into and be completely thrown. Um, the pattern recognition section, for example, I, I cannot do that. I look at those and my brain just goes, ah! Um, now, if I were to practice that for a couple of days, perhaps it wouldn't be so bad. Um, but um, I'd say with the UCAT, it's really helpful to have a bit of practice because it is a bit of a strange exam. It's much stranger than the BMAT, um, which I think is on the whole easier to revise for, even if it is perhaps a little more difficult because of the additional scientific knowledge you have to uh, bring to bear on it. Um, right, I'm just gonna have to take a couple more questions before we escape. Um, and uh, Manal asks about the essay contest. Um, I do not know anything about the essay contest. I don't know who judges that. Um, so I don't know what the criteria for succeeding are. Um, this is a good one to get in touch with us um, for a consultation because someone will have the specification or will have some tips. Um, but I, I, that is not something I'm involved in and I have no idea. Um, <laughs> If you do book a consultation, we'll be able to look into the answer for it. We'll be able so, to get back to you with that. There you go. Someone knows, but it's not me, unfortunately. <laughs> um, fab. And um, Lukman has a couple of questions um, about being uh, about preparing early. Um, so the, the our program is set up to on a kind of year basis. Um, so if you're coming to join us now with the um, expectation of applying this time next year, um, there'll be a tiny bit of repetition of the material. Um, but to an extent, that's a really good thing because it means you'll be having a first pass at some of it now. You'll be able to get out of you. You'll be able to do a bad job of the BMAT or the UCAT a year ahead. You'll know what you're preparing for and you'll be able to come back the following year with a full year's worth of preparation and come back to those things that are the most important. So if you're planning it, um, for an application in, what would it be, two months and one week's time um, next year, then joining us, joining us now, having that kind of long lead in where you're spending plenty of time getting ready for the exam, but also having the chance to do it, maybe a practice run this year, um, can be particularly valuable because even if you are repeating things, you're repeating the really key things. And, you know, a year apart, that kind of um, refreshing, that kind of building on of what you've done in the past can really, really pay off. Um, I think we'll call it a day there. Um, Thank you so much for joining me, Rowan. It has been lovely to see you. It's lovely yeah. to see so many people here. Uh, it's been very busy and exciting this week. Um, and hopefully I will see all of you and all of your friends, family, um, well-wishers um, next week when uh, I'm hoping that we'll be talking about uh, personal statement do's and don'ts. And I'll be getting out some of my favorite terrible personal statements to have a look at. Uh, as, oh boy, are there some bad ones. Um, and some good ones, but they're not as, that's not as much fun. Um, so, um, all there is to say then is thank you so much all for coming. Um, thank you very much for being here as well, Rowan. Thank you. Thank you for having me and thank you for listening to me ramble. <laughs> <laughs> all right. And we'll um, speak to all of you next week. Have a lovely weekend. Enjoy the weather wherever you are. And um, very best of luck with your, your applications. Thank you very much. We'll speak soon. Bye.